Happy Sabbath, everyone. <laughs> Welcome once again, and uh, glad to be here uh, for the monthly presentation. Before we get started on the title, To Be Tested and To Test, let's take a moment in prayer. Our Father, thank you so very much for this opportunity to present to everyone that will listen to view thy word. May you fill me with thy spirit, because I want you to just use this vessel now to speak to even my heart and to every heart that is exposed to this message. Pray that you will guide us, make us the people that we need to be for this hour, and I pray that uh, we would be guided all through the message. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Again, happy Sabbath. This message uh, kind of leaps off of a personal testimony I did about two months ago, but it also then goes into depth of what our responsibility is once we receive the message. So I'm going to give the perspective of being tested, and then we're supposed to turn around and test. Now, based upon Matthew chapter 10, verses 37 to 38, so let's uh, go there for a moment, shall we? Matthew chapter 10, and we're going to take a look here in verses 37 to 38. Matthew chapter 10, verse 37 says, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. After leaving the uh, Catholic Church because of the message, I fell in love with the message when I heard it in a seminar series, I was eventually challenged, uh, and the most challenging person happened to me be my mother. My mother suspected that something was, was up. Uh, I had moved to a different Catholic church prior to, uh, to going to the seminars, God preparing me for a uh, slight transition, if you would. Uh, as far as the family appearance is concerned. I no longer attended the church that I grew up in, but as in a typical city, there's multiple Catholic churches. And so I just chose the next nearest one to the home and attended that one instead. And then a few months later, had the seminar, and then, of course, I stopped attending the Catholic church, that is. Well, my mother has friends everywhere, and my mother would ask, did, I, uh, did you see Jerry at, at church? Did you, and um, eventually, after a long period of time of no one ever seeing me at church, my mother point blank asked me, are you attending the Catholic Church anymore? Thinking that simply as a lax Catholic, I might have drifted away from attendance. But that wasn't the case. I had actually requested to be off the Catholic list, but they never removed me. Uh, the thought is, once a Catholic, always a Catholic. Well, that's what they can think. What's in the eyes of God is more important than what man thinks. Anyways, yes, I stopped attending the Catholic Church. And then as soon as she realized and point blank asked me, are you uh, still a Catholic? I said, no, I'm not actually. And I said, I'll be right back. And what happened was I went, because I lived only two blocks away, walked up to my house, grabbed the Bible, and came back and said, Mother, I would like to tell you that I have become a Seventh-day Adventist. Well, the shock on her face was uh, quite astonishing. Um, she basically died in the, in the spot. Uh, she thought I was lost forever. And uh, she believed that all her life, that if you leave the Catholic Church, you're lost. And that was her motivation, that she wanted me back in the church for that sake. During the Bible study, I said, uh, uh, 
you know, I no longer can call, for instance, any man father, spiritually speaking. And I showed in the scripture, and she didn't have an answer for that. Uh, there was a few other things, and eventually, in a short period of time, I came across showing her the Sabbath. And I says, the commandment says this, but the Pope says otherwise. She didn't have an answer for that. At that very moment, she picked up the Bible from me, out of my hands, closed the book, and wailed it at me. I, with tears starting to form in my eyes, picked up the Bible and quietly left the home, not to return, not to communicate, for a period of six months. My sister, who was much younger at the time, I was 29, my sister happened to be about 13 years old, could not stand that type of separation. In fact, she would leak to me that every time uh, my family, without me of course, uh, would drive past the Seventh-day Adventist church, my mother would always make some type of comment. Oh, there's that church that stole away Jerry. And she was just filled with animosity. But like I said, about six months into that type of relationship or lack thereof, my sister took it upon herself to come up with a scheme that would allow the communication to happen. She came to me one day and said, Mom is sorry for what had happened. Well, she should have actually apologized, but being new in the faith, I did not go to that extent. And it was under the understanding that as long as I don't bring up the religion, we could actually have communication. And she said, did you have anything you would like to say? And I said, no, not really. She's the one that threw the Bible at me. And she evidently told my mother, and this came out many years later in 2017, that, uh, that um, uh, she said to my mother that she w he was sorry that he had left on such terms. And, uh, and so that obviously, uh, like I said, when I found that out many years later, that really bothered me. Well, why did I pick on 2017? That's the year my father had died. We all gathered together on his uh, birthday, which was one month after uh, his passing. And uh, it was there that it slipped out that my whole family was deceiving me for, uh, well, since 1994. And uh, that began a period of silence. And to add, I guess, salt to the wound, but all in God's hands, my mother this past year uh, was actually dying of cancer, uh, it, which was uh, 2021. She was dying of cancer. And she had texted a message and says, I'd like to have one more gathering together. Would you mind, your sister would like to put together a gathering on December the 24th, Christmas Eve. And I had texted back and says, Mom, I keep the Sabbath. That happens to be Friday night. I cannot come and visit. How about if you and, and the family get together Christmas night instead? It's just 24 hours later. I never heard a message back. And that was the last message I ever communicated with my mother before she died January 7th. And so about a year ago, I was listening to a sermon with Bill, and Paul happened to make a, a statement. He said that he was worked up and upset, rightfully so, that a whole bunch of Seventh-day Adventists were skipping out on church service to keep Christmas with their family, unbelievers even, and were counseled not to on the Sabbath day to be with unbelievers in that kind of capacity. And it actually brought tears to my eyes, and I was actually encouraged 
by such strong words from Paul that it, it touched my heart that you're right. We are to be faithful. Even when we have a dying mother, the Sabbath comes first. And that's why I put up those scriptures. You have a question, Paul? Yeah, I, I don't want to take your time. This is an important topic. But listening to what you're saying, I have to make say this. My father had 13 brothers and sisters, of which two were sisters, the rest were boys. Um, my aunts and uncles hated my mother. They were strict Roman Catholic, and my father met my mother. The deal was, you have to convert to, my mother was Seventh-day Adventist. They came over from Italy, they heard the message, and my grandmother, very intelligent woman, my mother's mother, switched. Well, deal was, long story short, he had to become a Seventh-day Adventist, which he did. I'm not going to get into that. However, they got married privately. Even as a little child, from when I was able to perceive people, I felt the animosity and hatred in my aunts and uncles' homes that were because my mother condemned my father and his children to hell. I had no contact with, I have many cousins all over this country on my father's Soprano side. I have no contact with them. And to the day that my uncle's aunt's Prano grandmother went to the grave, loathed my mother. And I felt that it was like an ire. It was like burning through you. And I, we were heretics. <clears throat> they didn't even want us under their roof. Uh, I have some, it wasn't a mother-son relationship, but hey, I know what you're talking about. And it's sad. I yeah. feel nothing but sympathy for these people, but the absolute hatred Yes, she was the demon woman that condemned Louis Prano to hell because yep. of that conversion. Exactly. So it's very strong, absolutely. It, it, it burns in you. Yep. How about the relationship with employment? And I'm trying to encourage people that those that are especially new and um, are struggling with trying to be a Seventh-day Adventist at first, because I remember that first challenging year be, being new in the faith. There's all kinds of new things and a lot of struggles at first, and Satan likes to discourage right up front. And I'm just trying to say, folks, I've been there. Many of people that uh, have listened to this message, especially first generation, have been there and we all share in the struggles and we want to encourage you to always keep your eyes on Jesus. As far as the employment is concerned, I had a very nice relationship with an employer. Uh, as soon as I mentioned that I had become a Seventh-day Adventist, he wasn't one, but he said, I respect that and whatever you need, you can, can have. And at that time, he was uh, the employer, which also was the owner of the company, brought on a partner, and he was a Christian, uh, to, to say, but in his uh, understanding, he said, I'm probably going against the Bible that we're not supposed to be unequally yoked, but I think I'm strong enough. Well, he wasn't, because after a number of years in that relationship, which was the most beautiful job whatsoever, they turned around and used the Sabbath against me, in which, back in the time of the 90s, Sabbath, uh, or sunset in winter, was adjusted from the end of October, not November, the end of October. They, that was sort of a, not too long ago that they made the adjustment. Uh, but nonetheless, shortly after the 2000s, I, my employer started to give me the difficulties. It would also go all the way to April. That's how long until the clocks change. It was almost like a six months on and six months off. Now it's only four months, barely, uh, uh, on one cycle and eight on the other. And now they're tr trying to get a, rid of it all together. But nonetheless, I would use half days off. And I had enough vacation time to get me through those six months. But what would happen uh, is that my employer 
turned around and decided that they were going to change the rule because they wanted me out of my position now. They no longer, uh, because the new co-owner was more cutthroat and not sympathetic to religion whatsoever, bringing in alcoholic Thursday nights after work, uh, they would throw free drinks to all the employees, and I would not attend those things. Uh, and basically, I was becoming an outcast, and they made a rule that you now had to take whole days off. Well, so many weeks into the Sabbath, come January, I was out of uh, taking vacation time. There was no opportunity, and I did not believe in the, well, while you're driving home, if the sun's setting, it's okay. No, you're supposed to be in the home in bringing in the Sabbath with your family, not arriving and uh, uh, doing all that's necessary to unload the, the vehicle with whatever you carried to work and uh, containers for lunch, and all, all that stuff. No, I believe that you should have been in the home, and that's why I was taking off half days. And that wasn't allowed. So needless to say, even my employer cut me out uh, using the Sabbath against me. But I chose again. I'd rather have Jesus than whatever this world has to offer. Isn't that a beautiful song as well? All right. Now, let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and let's switch gears. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and let's see here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and let's look here at verses 19 and 20, it says, quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying. That is not just a reference, by the way, to prophets. Though we are not supposed to despise, well, actual prophecy, any type of preaching that is conducted, we're not supposed to just automatically despise it. Uh, that's why certain denominations get such a bad, bad name is that, oh, you're not of my denomination? Well, we don't want to hear any message. And that is not the attitude we're supposed to have. We're to test the message that comes before us and test the spirit. Now, how are you supposed to test that? Using the word of God. Using the, in our case, that we have that, the advantage of the spirit of prophecy. And so that's what I would like to do now is switch gears and realize that just because we have preachers that are Seventh-day Adventists in name does not make them actually a Seventh-day Adventist preacher. Now, I would like to start right up front and state that we do not hear a truth triumphant, do not attack people. We attack error. There's a difference, by the way, between people making a mistake. I was watching uh, Cody's message from uh, last Sabbath, and he happened to say in uh, his message that uh, we are covered by the sin of Christ. And then he corrected himself and said, no, the blood of Christ. Because, of course, Christ did not commit sin, and we're not covered by sin. He corrected himself. That's a mistake. When a preacher actually preaches it, does not correct himself, it's brought to his attention and he refuses to change, especially when scripture and the spirit of prophecy is provided and there is no rebuttal using scripture back, it's just an opinion at that point, then that is a person in error. So it is important to know the difference, by the way, if we are attacking a person, which I don't like his hair color, is an attack. What he said is I disagree with, and here's why. That is an error. You see, the reason why it's important is because too many people idolize their favorite preachers. Now, I'm not saying you can't have a person that you really like listening to. But if they are in error on something, it needs to be called. That's why it is important. We are not to put our trust in man and idolizing what 
a speaker is, no matter what, and make all kinds of excuses. Oh, it's just a mistake. That's a serious mistake. We're going to see here. Now, right up front, I'm going to challenge almost every Seventh-day Adventist preacher. What are preachers commanded of God? According to First Selected Messages, page 126, paragraph 1, we are told that let the church arise and repent of her backslidings before God. Which church? The Catholic Church? No, of course not. We're talking this church. Let the watchmen be uh, awake and give the trumpet a certain sound. Okay, the, look, the uh, Sunday law is coming in. Look, uh, here's the Antichrist. No, that's not what it's ta talking about either. It is a definite warning that we have to proclaim. God commands his servants, cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Isaiah 58.1. It's about cleaning up the church. Don't give me this wheat and tares that they both are supposed to grow together to the end and, and God's going to separate it. He's going to separate it with the angels as th that parable says. Well, which angels do you think that happens to be? It's the three angels' messages. In other words, God will still use preachers and the body of Christ to actually reprove the transgressions and the sins that are happening in the church and that by the time the second coming happens they're already in the two camps either the bundled for facing the destruction at the second coming or ready to be gathered into the barns so beginning with one of the things that is very concerning to me that I had heard from a particular preacher, not revealing who it is just yet, there was a question, should a Christian vote? According to this YouTube link, and you would actually, if you want to see the message yourself, would actually have to type it in, but I provide it to you so that you know that where it comes from. But according to the Review and Herald, November 8, 1880, 81, and I'm not going to um, uh, actually answer this question, but that's actually the title of a sermon. In this sermon, it is misquoted by using this uh, reference of Ellen White. In our favored land, every voter, see you should vote according to this, has some voice in determining what laws shall control the nation. Should not that influence in that vote be cast on the side of temperance and virtue? Uh, excuse me, that has nothing about voting for a person or a political party. What this is in referring to happens to be, if there's a referendum in a time of voting, definitely go and vote on that issue. But we cannot safely be putting our trust in human beings to deliver us in these political challenges. So he, then he turns around at the 42 minute mark and the 40 to 43 minute mark and basically puts down the notion that if we vote for somebody into office that we are responsible for their sins that are committed while they're in office, making light of the subject, joking about it, who's he really putting down? Who stated that we we're responsible? It's Ellen White. Therefore, to make a comment that says, oh, and that thing that we're responsible for, never mind, don't worry about that, is throwing away Ellen White. According to Gospel Workers, page 391, paragraph 2, this is the full quote of Ellen White. The people of God are not to vote to place such men in office, for when they do this, they are partakers with them of the sins which they commit while in office. Again, I'm not arguing should we vote or not vote. What I'm concerned about is this is an error when someone is misquoting Ellen White or misapplying Ellen White, turns around and dismisses Ellen White, and then laughs it off taking it out of the context, realizing that that was a put down of the prophet. That is in an attack on her writings. Now, who in the world would have done such a thing? Again, keep in mind, I'm attacking error, 
not a person that is responsible for bringing many people to Christ, and I believe many souls that they were involved with will be in heaven, but we have to call error really outright, and that happens to be none other than Doug Batchelor. Same person was asked the question, should we have the marital privilege that I would like to say in a more gentler way? On the Sabbath, should that such activity happen on the Sabbath was a question. And again, I'm, I'm going to leave that to you. Should married people have that particular privilege of that activity on the Sabbath? And again, that's not what I'm going to address. What I'm going to address is how the answer was handled. And here is, from Amazing Facts, this link that you can then watch yourself to see how Doug actually handles the situation. And this is what we have. Adam was, he made Adam to be a lustful creature that could not control himself just for one day. You watch that sermon, and he basically says, this is the most beautiful woman that God could ever create. You see, man has in their heads what, what exactly the type of person they want to marry, and what they'll be like, and what they look like, and all kinds of shapes, and, and everything about this. Well, guess what? When God made Eve, that was the most perfect, flawless person to ever marry. Unlike today, today we kind of compromise because, well, sin has distorted different features, for instance, and their personality is not 100% as we expect it. They're not a clone copy of ourselves, basically. And that's possibly a good thing because we're supposed to complement, not be copies of each other. But nonetheless, what I'm trying to stress here is that I agree with Doug that said that this was the most beautiful woman to ever walk the face of the earth, especially from the perspective of Adam. Adam could not say, uh, I, don't, I don't like how they, they chew an apple. Can I have another woman, please? No. This is the most satisfying woman to ever walk this planet. However, being created here at the end of the sixth day, Doug Batchelor turns around and says, there you have the most beautiful creature. Are you telling me for 24 hours he's being told, got to keep your hands off, got to keep your hands off? No, they actually performed the act there on the seventh day. Excuse me? You mean somebody that has not fallen into sin, not peer pressured, go for it, go for it, not uh, seeing any other images in the world that encourages such sinful thoughts, not that that activity is sinful, that that would be on Adam's mind? Are you really kidding me? First off, there is the Sabbath time with Jesus. This is how the seventh day of this earth would have gone as far as first they're introduced. They are now have a conversation with Jesus. Who, who knows how long that conversation went on. Yes, Adam named all the animals. I have many times have done something around the home. And I am so excited to show what I've done to my wife as opposed to having on my mind any other activity. So I would imagine that at some point then, Adam introduces all the animals and didn't just name, rename them again, but rather explain why they were given the name. And it probably took all day. And they toured the place. Come on, Eve. I've been walking around here. Let me show you this. Let me show you that. That is what would be on my mind. And I'm a fallen creature. This is an unfallen person. Adam never s sinned yet. Are you telling me that he could not be in control for 24 hours? Doug, that, that's your basis to say, yep, go ahead and enjoy yourself. Excuse me? Again, if you partake in the 
activity on Sabbath and you see nothing wrong with it, that's fine. Those that say, no, 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 you're not supposed to have your own pleasure on the Sabbath, and you use that as the, your basis, that's fine. That's not the point here. The point here is how Doug made Adam to be a lustful creature that was uncontrolled by his passions and just had to have Eve. That is wrong. And that's basically uh, what I summarized, got ahead of my own paragraph. Then how about the mega facility? I mean, I'm amazing facts trained. I have tapped into Doug's mind as far as the explanation of many tough scriptures, and I appreciate it. And this is not an attack on Doug, but on the different things that are in error. A mega facility that cost over $28 million? Alan White wrote in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 8, page 150, people are encouraged to settle in Battle Creek to give their influence to the building up of a modern Jerusalem. That's what that is. This is not after God's order. So Battle Creek being built up as opposed to a facility that cost $28 million. Thus, other places are deprived of the facilities that should, uh, they should have. I was trained actually in Maryland being the last class before it shipped out to Sacramento. Well, actually Black Hills. But what we have here is that now Maryland was deprived, the East Coast was deprived basically of a facility to go for training. Enlarge ye, spread ye, that's what we're supposed to do, spread out, not try to make a mega facility. Yes, but not in one place only. Go out and establish centers of influence in places where nothing or next to nothing has been done. Break up your consolidated mass. Diffuse the saving beam, uh, beams of light into the darkened corners of the earth. A work similar to that of an eagle stirring up the nest needs to be done. So if we had a facility that was uh, focused just on media in one place, and Amazing Facts had a Bible s school in another place, that's what she would have preferred. But a mega facility that has loads of classrooms, church facility, mega uh, media uh, facility, no, that, that completely wrong. How about this question? What is accomplished by debating people? And what I'm referring to, I didn't put up the, the reference, but look it up. Maybe it's on the next screen, because I see that this is part one of two. But let's, let's do the quote, and we'll see what I have on the next screen. Evangelism, page 165, paragraph one. Ministers who contend with opposers of the truth of God, and I have to tell you uh, before we get there, what this is based on is that a number of years ago, Doug Batchelor had a non-Seventh-day Adventist preacher up on the platform. It was the Sabbath debate. Doug was going to present all the pros to keeping the Sabbath and address any cons that were brought up. The other preacher invited was free to argue to the best of their ability to their blue in the face of why people don't have to keep the Sabbath. At the end of it, I've heard many of those that watched it, I did not, I refused to watch it, I knew it was wrong, said that, oh yeah, Doug, Doug did a great job, he, he upheld the Sabbath. Hmm. Ministers who contend with opposers of the truth of God do not have to meet men merely, but Satan. Doug was not debating that preacher, he was debating Satan and his host of evil angels. Satan watches for a chance to get the advantage of ministers who are advocating the truth, and when they cease to put their entire trust in God, and I'm sorry, I'm going to tell you that at that point, for Doug to have done that, there was an ego problem. That he crossed the line at that point, and that's one of the reasons why I did not want to watch that. Their words are not in the spirit of love of Christ. The angels of God cannot strengthen and enlighten them. They leave them to their own strength, and evil angels press in their darkness. For this reason, the opponents of the truth sometimes seem to have the advantage, and the discussion does, not, does more harm than real good. By bringing darkness 
that that pastor represented before the congregation, filled with mostly Seventh-day Adventists, allowed no different than King Saul bringing Agag into the camp when he was told to kill Agag. He brought into the camp, Doug is, brought into the camp darkness, invited Satan and the evil angels. Even if it is true that Doug won, any argument against the Sabbath that was presented by this minister undermined those that were weak in the faith and whoever watched it video-wise, because it's on YouTube, whoever watches it and is weak in the faith may cling or have cling, clung to one of those reasons that were brought up and said, yeah, I believe that, instead of solidifying in the faith. You see, Doug at this point feels that he is so confident that he can face any argument against the Sabbath, and that's why he crossed the line for ego. You do not invite debate. That is not how Jesus operated, and that is not how a true pastor of God would operate. Oh, and there is the YouTube video. Go watch it yourself. Doug debates the Sabbath with another denominational preacher in front of the Seventh-day Adventist congregation. We are not to allow the enemy to come into the camp. Those that do not see pastors of other denominations as the enemies do not understand that the church is Israel and all other denominations make up Babylon. You see, that's where the breakdown happens to be. If we do not view, I hate to say it, I, I, I love Episcopalians, I love Catholics, I, I, I love Methodist people, but they're our enemy. They are working against the truth knowingly or unknowingly. They are the enemy of God. They make up Babylon. And Babylon, literally, was the enemy of Israel. Israel, and this is what I'm saying, if you do not understand this, Israel is the Seventh-day Adventist church. Not all that are of Israel, or claim to be of Israel, are of Israel, of course. Just like everyone that claims to be a Seventh-day Adventist are not really a Seventh-day Adventist. So in this case, what we have here is the lack of understanding that the Seventh-day Adventist church, the, the, not the system, the structure, or anything like that, we're talking God's people who truly, before the name was actually put on a building that truly are Seventh-day Adventists make up Israel. In fact, we're going to be part of the New Jerusalem. We are going to uh, be part of the heavenly Israel. And right now, we are, when we become born again and join the faith, yes, we write it on some type of book, but when our names are written in heaven, we have become part of heaven's Israel. Go ahead, Cody, you have a question or a statement? And, and that, unlocks, that unlocks the proper understanding of Daniel chapter 11, where it talks about um, the glorious land versus the glorious exactly. holy mountain. So you have, you have the land of Israel, where you have people who, who are true Christians and some who are not. It's, it's the whole land. Just like you said, there are many of Israel who are not of Israel, you know, in heart. And then once the tribulation comes through, you see this, this, other, this other thing being set up here as, as the image of God's people, and it's called the glorious holy mountain, and it shows the difference in character between those who have been weeded out before the shaking versus after. Amen. Thank you. So, having the proper understanding of the, when we see the, pro, uh, the prophecies of the Old Testament, as uh, Cody just brought out, a lot, we have to understand that Paul in Corinthians says that the people of the Old Testament, the prophets of the Old Testament, wrote more for our day, this last generation day, than for any other people. But when you literally read the scriptures, especially when you see Isaiah and every reference to Israel, if you don't see that applying to the Seventh-day Adventist church, you're missing out on a whole lot of blessings and a whole lot of guidance. Mm -hmm. 
the scriptures of the Old Testament apply to us more today than their day. So even though supposedly Doug defended well, the undermining seeds of doubt were planted among the weak of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Who kept the statistic of how many, after that episode, how many Seventh-day Adventists actually gave up the, the Seventh-day Adventist faith? There, we don't have that statistic. Even if it's one soul that's teetered, but because of what the pastor from the other denomination said, and they left, Doug is responsible for that soul. Should our skin be pricked? And I have to say it this way, being cautious. And I hope that this is careful enough. Again, we're involving Doug Batchelor. And this isn't all about Doug Batchelor, by the way. This might be the last item. But according to the Facebook presentation, there's three pastors that are together. Uh, John, Doug, and um, some other person, and we'll just say, that was hosting it. And the topic was, change the word pricked it into the, uh, of course, uh, what is forbidden. But uh, nonetheless, they're having a discussion. Should you get that? And in the discussion, during the video, a question was read. If the skin, and I, the, I changed the word so that hopefully it gets past the censoring, uh, be pricked, made with unclean ingredients. Does that make uh, the item unclean? and should be rejected. That's what a caller asked for. And in their argument, the response, ah, there we go. It's uh, Doug Batchelor, John Ross, and Carlos Munez. The response from the three-person panel was that pig valves, valves, so they're saying that, you know, hey, people every day get valves put in their hearts, and unclean contents are not eaten, therefore it is permissible. So that means if you need uh, an adjustment on your heart, and you have to have a pig valve implanted, or you die, you should get the pig valve. That, that, that's OK with God. Really? It is? You know, when God said it's unclean, I'm pretty sure he said that you're not supposed to touch it. It's not just about if it goes through the mouth. So they're saying that if it's injected into the skin, that it's OK. It's not. They even went as far as uh, saying then that all oh, the ingredients are so uh, manipulated and uh, by the time that it's actually a part of the formula, you can't even tell the trace of where it came from being unclean. So therefore, if I'm cooking a meal and it calls for lard or something like that, or some other small pig unclean ingredient that it's okay? Oh, no, their excuse is it goes through the mouth. Hmm, interesting. Just because it's the mouth, everything else is okay. It does not make sense whatsoever. That is error. We are not to even touch it. The Bible teaches us that. All right, I promise. Moving away from Doug and gang, In our household, when I became a Seventh-day Adventist, I was definitely very strong involved with the conference. I was a lay evangelist, uh, self-supporting evangelist, that is, uh, planted a church under conference guidance, uh, very involved with Sabbath school and church service, and spoke quite often at the home church, if you would. And so very much involved. But when the truth of God was being shut down, and I'm finding less and less opportunity to share the message, to speak, to actually discuss in the Sabbath school, where those that are in attendance basically are telling you to, as most of uh, people who stand for the faith, they get shut down eventually and cannot progress. The option is then to home church. Of course, those that are in the conference says, oh, uh, you're not supposed to leave the church, stay in the boat. That's a form of leaving the boat because you left the conference church, and that's utter nonsense. When you are being manipulated and being force-fed error, especially when the Sabbath school lessons are filled with 
ministers of other denominations giving their input, a Jesuit telling us how to keep the Ten Commandments. These are quarterlies around the late 1900s, early 2000s. And that's what I'm referring to. Filled with many uh, inputs and articles from priests, atheists contributing to the Sabbath School quarterly as well. There's something wrong there. I don't want to be studying the quarterly, and I haven't studied the quarterly now for years. Well, if you're not part of Sabbath school, then what about the church service? Oh, you mean the church service that teaches you that you're saved in your sins, that you'll sin right up to the end, um, that you don't do anything, that if you're going to be saved, it's all God, uh, so stop working your way to heaven, uh, that just downplays the Seventh-day Adventist doctrines, hardly hearing anything about the literal three angels' messages. Oh, it might be referred to, but that's about it. And many other things. We turn to, um, turn to watching on Friday nights as a Vesper different people. And I don't want to uh, just explicitly for this one to, to provide names. But we noticed that as a family, we were jumping from one type of person to another because, well, a lot of the preachers were getting all excited. They were jumping up and down, yelling and screaming. Ellen White says, be careful of such preachers. They might have the truth, but if they're yelling and screaming, uh, and trying to work up a, uh, an excitement into the people. Uh, you got to get out there right now. Sunday law is coming tomorrow. Sunday law is coming tomorrow. And that's all their message happens to be. We need to be very careful of them. Evangelism, page 137. I have a message for those in charge of our work. Do not encourage the men who are to engage in this work to think that they must proclaim the solemn sacred message in a theatrical style. Not one jot or tittle of any theatricals is to be brought into our work. God's cause is to have a sacred heavenly mold. Let everything connected with the giving of the message for this time bear the divine impress. Let nothing of a theatrical nature be permitted, for this would spoil the sacredness of the work. Evangelism, page 170, paragraph 1. It is not excitement, see, we wish to create, but deep, earnest consideration that those who hear shall do solid work, real sound, genuine work that will be enduring as eternity. We hunger not for the excitement, for the sensational. The less we have of this, the better. The calm, earnest reasoning from the scripture is precious and fruitful. Here is the secret of success in preaching a living personal savior in so simple and earnest a manner that the people may be able to lay hold by faith of the power of the word of life. And the one person that I was uh, following ended up having uh, afternoon encouragement, quoting from the news articles, and really working up the people. And after three years of this, uh, it's like, OK, you keep promising Sunday law is coming, it's coming, it's coming. Uh, I, the anxiety, unnatural anxiety that was being created was what was wrong with the true message. In other words, everything that was said was right on spot, except it was working up a false excitement that anybody that gives it any period of time was actually getting burned out. Selected Messages, Volume 2. If we work to create an excitement of feeling, we shall have all we want and more than we can possibly know how to manage calmly and clearly, preach the word, we must not regard it as our work to create an excitement. So I was okay with naming Doug, but yet I'm not naming names here uh, on this one, and that's because it actually covers many, many, many preachers. Are we saved in our sins? And I started off with this truth triumphant does not attack people, and yet for several months, it was being attacked for saying something uh, about a certain individual that was providing wonderful messages, wonderful insight to historical things. And uh, yet, the problem is, is that we have a problem with being told 
that we are saved in our sins. And so rightfully, that no matter all the work which lead, could lead many to Jesus, don't doubt that whatsoever, but when I first heard that message from Walter Vieth four years ago, our family stopped watching that person as well because all the information that we saw was so wonderfully done that I went searching for more information until I came across not once but twice and now evidently more recently that we are being told we are saved in our sins and that is a flat out lie a flat out lie so when the fruit is brought forth immediately he put it forth the, in the sickle because the harvest has come Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church when the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced his people then he will come to claim them as his own. Christ Object Lessons, page 69. That tells me there's no sin in our lives. That's the goal. We're not going to sin up to the second coming. We're not going to sin right up to the uh, seven last plagues either. We are sealed before the seven last plagues. And he has a people that will be standing through that time, through Jacob's trouble, for that period of time, we know it's less than a year, however long the plagues pour out, we know that uh, he has a perfect people. How about date setting? Anybody that tries to take the prophecies from Daniel 12 and Revelation 13, I think it's verse 5, where the 42 months are, are not only in error, but are false teachers. And we should have nothing to do with them, especially if they are unrepentant. Great controversy, the 88 version, 1888 that is, page 439 says this. Power is given unto him to continue 40 and 2 months. That's the direct quote out of Revelation. And says the prophet, I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. And again, he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. The 40 and 2 months are the same as the time and times. And dividing a time, three years and a half or 1260 days of Daniel 7, the time during which the papal power was to oppress God's people, this period as stated in preceding chapters, began with the establishment of the papacy in 538 and terminated in 1798. So if anyone tries to tell you that the 42 months of Revelation 13 are outside of the prophecy and should be a literal period of time, do not give them any more of your time whatsoever. They are in error. Regarding the 1335, 1 SAT uh, 225, I think it's a Sabbath school lesson, but anyways, in his vision of the last days, Daniel inquired, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed to the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and um, five and thirty days, the thirteen thirty-five. But go thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. People take the 1335 years, the 1290 to 1260 in Daniel chapter 12, and say they're literal periods of time. According to Ellen White, she says, Daniel has been standing in his lot since the seal was removed, and the light of truth has been shining upon his visions. He stands in his lot bearing the testimony which was to be understood at the end of, the thir uh, of these days. The 1335 ended in 18, um, 1844, when it, uh, it pointed to, to the Millerite movement, basically. And so anybody that tries to throw those prophecies into the future have nothing to do with them. The 1335 ended in Ellen White's day and began the purifying time, the cleansing of the sanctuary time, and the wicked doing wickedly. Now, this is what I like about this message. This message... This paragraph I'm about to read came to me just a few moments, a few days ago. I had prepared this message a month ago, and when I saw this, I felt the confirmation of God with this. Our last quote, letter 54, uh, 
1890, in this paragraph it says, then the churches incurred the frown of God in exalting the man, praising the man, and putting him before them in the place of God, calling for him, expecting that a great work to be done through him. He must remain with them, else the interest should die. They thus dependently, blindly, on that, depend upon that man the place of looking entirely to God and believing that God would work for his church through its consecrated God-fearing members. This is our this is our sin as a people, trusting in man and making flesh our arm. God sees these things and it displeases him. He has let the man reveal what spirit he is of, and are there any so blind that they cannot see this? Oh, that this lesson may be for the instruction of all the churches, not to idolize any man that lives, but to let him hold his position, not because of his drawing, big congregations, but because he is a humble, God-fearing man and fears to offend God. And so, brothers and sisters, like I said, I feel that this summarizes everything. If we are idolizing Doug, Walter, Enrique, all of them, Bill even, myself, Cody, all of us, where we place oh, i got to listen to this person, and whatever they say is like God speaking to us. And we cannot separate the fact that when someone's in error, they need to be called on it. And if you do touch on that, Truth Triumphant and others like myself get attacked. You're attacking a person. You're attacking his anointed. No, we are not. We are attacking error, and we leave it at that. It's up to you to decide, are you going to follow the error or follow the man in place of God? Uh, in place of God. God help us all. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you so very much for this, your blessed Sabbath. Thank you for the wake-up call. Again, as a reminder, we are to look upon these things, digest it for ourselves, research it out, see what pleases you and may we not be found idolizing anyone may we appreciate all the efforts all the contributions and that's not brought into question all the effort the sincerity none of it is in question but when outright acts are done may we realize that our responsibility as the title of this message happened to be we are to test every spirit and we are to discard that which is in error. And sometimes when people are just so hung on the error, we've got to stop listening to that because any moment it can come up again. And we should not be washing our minds through error of any sort. Please guard our minds and help us to be faithful Seventh-day Adventists prepared to meet you. We ask these things in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.